Amen. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Amen. How's everybody doing tonight? All right. Good to see everybody. It was a hot day today. I'm a little dehydrated, so be patient with me. I almost passed out a couple times today. Yeah, my God knows, huh? Thank God for Central Air. <laughs> All right, let's turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. The Holy Spirit will be taken over, so please be attentive to that. Clear your hearts and your minds to hear what the Spirit is trying to say to the church tonight. Amen? Amen. Okay. Distractions aside. Second Corinthians chapter 3. Go to verse 7. <laughs> Go to verse 7, please. <laughs> I can take the heat, but the humidity help me shop. The heat index was like 100. Huh? Are you in the paint booth too? Yeah. Uh, 110 degrees all day. <laughs> it's alright, the Holy Spirit will get me through this. <clears throat> having trouble grieving. <clears throat> okay. 2 Corinthians 3, verse 7. The old way or ministry with laws etched in stone led to death though it began with such glory that the people of Israel could not bear to look at Moses' face for his face shone with the glory of God even though the brightness was already fading away shouldn't we expect far greater glory under the new way now that the Holy Spirit is giving us life big amen there amen. If the old way, which brings condemnation, was glorious, how much more glorious is the new way, which makes us right with God? In fact, the first glory was not glorious at all compared with the overwhelming glory of the new way. So if the old way, which has been replaced, was glorious, how much more glorious is the new, which remains forever? Now, you have a lot of churches that are trying to mix the Old Covenant with the New Covenant. The Old Covenant has been done away with. There's no more Sabbath. There's no more following them things. Tithing. All that other stuff has been done away with with the New Covenant, which is the law of love. But there's churches that try to mingle it and bring it back, and it's a heresy. We're not going to fall into that here because we're going to listen to what the Bible says. Amen? <coughs> Now look what it says in verse 12. Since this new way gives us such confidence, we can be very bold. We are not like Moses, who, out, who put a veil over his face, so the people of Israel would not see the glory, even though it was destined to fade away. But the people's minds were hardened. A hardened mind is a closed mind. And to this day, whenever the Old Covenant is being read, the same veil covers their minds so they cannot understand the truth. And this veil can only be removed by believing in Jesus Christ. Amen? In fact, some of the Jews today are still waiting for Jesus. They're waiting for the Savior to come. They don't believe Jesus was the Messiah. So the veil is over their eyes right now. And over a lot of people's eyes. You can't get to God without believing in Jesus. Yes, even today, when they read Moses' writings, their hearts are covered with that veil. And they do not understand. Here's the Bible, but. But. Whenever someone turns to the Lord. Whenever someone turns to the Lord. The veil is taken away. 
The moment you believe in Jesus, the Holy Spirit comes into you. And now your eyes are open to a spiritual understanding of the Bible. And now the written word becomes the living word. That's how it works. But if you don't believe in Jesus, your eyes never get open. Now, whenever someone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. For the Lord is the Spirit. The Lord is the Spirit. And wherever the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Freedom to what? Choose. Freedom to live a life worthy of your call. Freedom from your sin nature. So all of us who have had that veil removed can see and reflect the glory of the Lord. And the Lord, who is the Spirit, makes us more and more like him as we are changed into his glorious image amen the holy spirit comes in us little by slow what happens we start to transform the things we didn't believe before we start to believe the things we didn't see before we start to see you start to see what the world is actually following they're following the ways of the devil Whatever's in it for me, go for it, do it. Whatever I got to do to get myself ahead of things. The Bible says, no, we become the servant when you be believe in Jesus. You be take the low position. Amen? Amen? It's a whole transformation of thinking. Jesus was God, and he became what? A slave. To illustrate what, if you wanted to be godly on this earth, what you would have to do. You'd have to wash feet or serve the people. They don't serve you. You don't get the plaque. Jesus gets the glory. Amen? Amen? But in this world, everybody wants to get recognized for their achievements and their accomplishments, which you can't take with you. Whatever you gain down here, stays down here. Whatever you do down here for the Lord, comes with you. Amen? So once you understand that, I do. That's why whenever I get a chance to serve Him, here I am. Lord, use me. Because that's where the glory is and that's where the rewards are. Eternal rewards. Peace of mind and heart knowing you're in God's will. Doing His will, not yours. But some people just don't get it. That's okay. We're going to preach it till you do. <laughs> God uses a guy like me to help you understand that. <laughs> I got one for us now. Go with me to Galatians chapter 6, please. Everybody with me so far? I'm struggling, but the Holy Spirit is getting me through this. Thank you, Jesus. And I realize as I get older how much that takes out of me. Spending a little day out there and uh, when I was young I used to like nothing. It's starting to take a toll, you know. So a couple more years. By the grace of God, amen. Okay. Galatians chapter six, let's look at verse two. It tells us clearly, share each other's burdens. And in this way, obey the law of Christ. What's the law of Christ? Love. Love God and love your neighbor as yourself. So you share each other's burdens. We don't come to church like we all got it going on. We come to church because we know we don't have it going on. So we can share each other's burdens. Pain, we share our pains, right? We share our victories. We share the glory of God. Now look what it says in verse 3. If you think you are too important to help someone, you are only fooling yourself. You are not that important. Humbling statement, right? You are not that important. Look at verse 4. Pay careful attention to what everybody's doing around you. Oh, wait a minute. That's not in there. We're good at that though, aren't we? It says, <laughs> pay careful attention 
to your own life or your own work. For then you will get the satisfaction of a job well done and you won't need to compare yourself to anyone else. What do we do as Christians? Well, I'm not as bad as they are. No, the Bible says you sin once, you're guilty of every sin the Bible has and we're all equal. Amen? Nobody's better than anybody else in the Christian life. We are all equal and it doesn't have, we don't compare ourselves with material stuff. We compare ourselves with spiritual stuff. We all believe in Jesus. Guess what? We're all equal. And that's why we can all get along in here. Right? Amen. Now, look at verse 6. Those who are taught the word of God should provide for their teachers, sharing all good things with them. So the Bible tells us clearly, people who teach the word of God should be able to get provided for by the people that he serves that's in the biblical truth even though i don't get that but you know that is a biblical truth those who work should get paid amen but you don't get paid you don't do this as a job you do it as a servant amen that's right now it says <laughs> sharing all good things with them don't be misled you cannot mock the justice of God. You will always harvest what you plant. Those who live, we're talking to believers here now, only to satisfy their own sinful nature will harvest decay and death from that sinful nature. But those who live to please the Spirit will harvest everlasting life from the Spirit. Amen? Reaping and sowing principle People call it karma, whatever you want to call it. That law never goes away. You always harvest what you plant. More than you plant and later than you plant. Big amen there, right? So if you harvest, if you plant good, you harvest good. You plant bad, you harvest bad. As believers. Now look at verse 9. So let's not get tired of doing what is good. How many of us get weary doing this? We keep doing good. We keep doing good. We, get, we don't think we're getting any results from it. But we are. It says, at just the right time, at just the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessings if we don't what? Give up. Don't ever give up. Just keep doing good because it's the right thing to do. Therefore, whenever we have the opportunity... We should do good to everyone, especially to those in the family of the faith. So we should do good to everybody, even unbelievers, but especially to our brothers and sisters. Always be ready to do good for them and help them. Verse 11. Notice what large letters I use as I write these closing words in my own handwriting. Those who are trying to force you to be circumcised want to look good to others or those who are trying to make you follow outward principles. Okay? They don't want to be persecuted for teaching that the cross of Christ alone can save us. What do we teach here? The cross of Christ alone is what saves us. See what it says? Okay. And then it says... And those who advocate circumcision don't keep the whole law themselves. They only want you to be circumcised so they can boast about it and claim you as their disciples. As for me, this is Paul, may I never boast about anything except the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because of that cross, or because of him, my interest in this world has been crucified. And the world's interest in me has also died. It doesn't matter whether we've been circumcised or not. What counts is whether we have been transformed into a new creation. Big amen there, right? That's what counts. <laughs> May God's peace and mercy be upon all who live by this principle 
They are the new people of God. Amen? Amen. From now on, Paul was saying this, Don't let anyone trouble me with these things, for I bear on my body the scars that show that I belong to Jesus. Dear brothers and sisters, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. So, how many of us got battle scars from serving the Lord? It says that's going to be normal. It's normal to get battle scars <laughs> as we fight to get the gospel out there. Amen. Great scripture. That was just given to me when I was here coming. Said, You're gonna, the Holy Spirit told me to say that to you. So I did. Let the Spirit speak, right? This is Spirit led ministry. So it's important to understand what really counts that we've been what? Transformed into a new creation and our interest in the world should start to diminish i know mine has if, the, if if i could be here seven days a week i would be that's how much i need to be here my spiritual my spirituality wants to get fed more and more and my material doesn't want any of that anymore i want this it's transforming it's a process though it's a process. not everybody gets there at the same time I get an amen for this. All right, let's go to Mark chapter 1. Does anybody remember where we left off? <laughs> We're going to back up a little. <laughs> All right. Let's back up to verse 10. Chapter 1 of Mark. And if you weren't here for the beginning, you could always go back and get it off the website. Oh, we'll go to nothing. The baptism and temptation of Jesus. One day, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee, and John baptized him in the Jordan River. Remember, we talked about it before. Why did Jesus have to get baptized? He didn't have any sin in him. But if John's baptism was for repentance from sin, why was Jesus baptized? Well, even the greatest prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel, had to confess their sinfulness and need for repentance. Jesus didn't need to admit sin. He was sinless. Although Jesus didn't need forgiveness, he was baptized for a couple of reasons, okay? One, to begin his mission and to bring the message of salvation to all people. That was the beginning of his ministry. Two, to show support for John's ministry. Ministries support ministries that are teaching truth. Amen? Okay. Three, to identify with our humanness and sin. Jesus came so he identified with other people so they knew that he was God but he was also human. And four... To give us an example to follow. Verse 10. As Jesus came up out of the water, he saw the heavens splitting apart and the Holy Spirit descending on him or toward him or into him like a dove. So they said the, the heavens split open and something like a dove came down on him as a tangible sign of the Holy Spirit entering into Jesus. Imagine, and a voice, verse 11, from heaven said, You are my dearly loved son, and you bring me great joy. Like I said before, that was the Trinity right there, right? The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit became one that day. The Spirit, look at and let me just say this, the Spirit descended like a dove on Jesus, and the voice from heaven proclaimed the Father's approval of Jesus, as his divine son. Here we see all three members of the Trinity together. God the Father. God the Son. And God the Holy Spirit. Amen. If anybody questions the Trinity. There it was. And it's the beginning right there. There is no salvation without the Trinity. Okay. We have to understand that. Okay, the dove and the voice from heaven were signs that Jesus was the Messiah. 
Many people want something tangible, visible and real before they will believe. So Jesus did healings and other miracles and God raised him from the dead and still people doubt it. Imagine seeing somebody raised from the dead. Imagine seeing a blind man see or a lame man walk again and then still not believe in he was the son of God. Wow. Will visible signs convince anyone? The sign that really brings us to faith is the power of God's message to answer the cry of our hearts. To the confused, God offers a mind enlightened by faith. Okay? To the depressed, God offers a reason for joy. To the lonely, God offers eternal companionship. Don't look for a spectacular visible sign. Instead, seek a cleansed and renewed life as evidence of his presence in your life. Big amen there, right? All right, let's go to verse 12. Is everybody with me so far here? I feel better. I'm with my family. I didn't know if I was going to make it a little while ago. My brother Wayne will tell you what it feels like when you get that heat exhaustion. You just. <sighs> well, whoever works out there in this kind of weather. Okay, look at verse 12. The Spirit then compelled Jesus to go into the wilderness. I use this example, compelled him. What do you mean compelled him? There was an inclination. Something came into his mind to go do it. Just like when you think of something, something comes into your mind, that's a compelling from the Holy Spirit to do something for the Lord. Also, the devil will compel you to do something too. That's not of God. So we have to know what voice we're listening to when we get compelled. That's why you have to know the devil's voice and you have to know God's voice. That's why it's so important to study the Bible. Because we hear a lot of voices. But we have to listen to the right ones. Now, look what it says in verse 13. Where he was tempted by Satan for 40 days. He was out among the wild animals and angels took care of him. Now, before we go on, let me just explain who Satan really is, okay? Satan is an angel who rebelled against God. We have to understand that Satan at one time was God's right hand. But he said, no, I want to be it. I want to be God. He couldn't be satisfied being next to God, so God had to cast him out. So how many of us want to be God? That's the question. So when any of us try to be God, we're actually acting like who? Satan. Exactly. Can a believer act like Satan all the time? We think we have the answers to everybody's questions. We get proud. We get arrogant. It's right from who? The devil. Only God has all the answers. Okay? All right. He is real. He's not symbolic. Okay? He's not some guy with horns and a pitchfork. He's not symbolic. And is constantly working against God and those who obey him. Have you not noticed when you try to obey God how much the devil tries to make you disobey God? The closer and the more you try to do the right thing, the more the tempter comes and tries to pull you out of it. It's a principle that we all have to learn. It's spiritual warfare. You know, you have a you can't wait to go to church this, that, and then something will come up and try to trip you up for not to get here. Or something will come up and get into your mind and you won't end up showing up. Who do you think's doing that? God will never stop you from coming to church. The devil will. And he'll give us many reasons why not to come so we don't get fed what we need to fight against him. We put other things in front of God. God said, put me first. And everything will work out well for you. How many people put him first though? That's the question. 
We all fight to put him first, right? All of us do. Okay? Satan tempted Eve in the garden and persuaded her to sin. Right? He tempted Jesus in the wilderness and did not persuade him to fall. To be tempted is not a sin. Tempting others or giving in to temptation is sin. Okay? Okay, now to identify fully with human beings, Jesus had to endure Satan's temptations. Jesus had to understand what we were going to go through so he would become our advocate. Can I get an amen for this? He had to go through everything that we went through and still not sin. Okay? Although Jesus is God, he also is man. And as fully human, he was not exempt from Satan's attacks. Because Jesus faced temptations and overcame them, he can assist us in two very important ways. Everybody listening now? One, as an example of how to face temptation without sinning, what did Jesus, how did he fight the devil? For it is written. He knew the scriptures in his mind and he fought the devil with scripture. It is written. So how do we fight the devil? With scripture, for it is written, he who is in me is stronger than he who is in the world. Amen? We have the power of God in us now, so we can resist him. It says, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee. Those are the principles of the Bible that we have to remember when he comes. Not if, when. Okay? Two, as a helper who knows just what we need, because he went through the same experience. That's why Jesus is our best friend. He went through everything and he still what? Didn't sin. He knows our weaknesses. He's such a great God. Amen? Amen? I don't know about you, but I love Jesus. Because when I go to him, he always listens. He understands. He always makes a way out and says, it's okay. It's okay. My grace covers that. Now it's just grow. Grow. Grow in my grace and knowledge so you don't have to. God will give us a desire not to do it anymore. When we're done with it. It says when you're finished with sin, you won't sin anymore. How many of us are still weak? In different areas. I'll tell you what, over my, over my experience with the Lord so far, I've been be able to resist many things that I used to fall into. But there's still things that I fall into, like frustration and anger and, and bitterness sometimes. Sometimes I get bitter and I can't understand why. Because there's still something in there that has to be put into the light. There's things in my heart that have never been revealed to me that I don't understand what they are. So I have to wait and God's going to show me what they are so that bitterness will subside and go away. So I pray to God to show me to take the bitterness out of my heart and fill it with your love. Because bitterness and spirituality don't mix. Whenever I'm bitter, the flesh is back. Can I get an amen for this? Okay. Everybody with me so far here? I'm trying to make it real so we understand why we need Jesus so much. He's our guy. Hebrews 4.15. Verse 14. I believe this is where we left off. Later on, after John was arrested, Jesus went into Galilee where he preached the good news. The time promised by God has come at last, he announced. The kingdom of God is near. Repent of your sins and believe the good news. Now, Think about it. John the Baptist. Now, he, he must have been some kind of like rough type of guy. He wore a leather belt and he ate locusts and everything. And he introduced the Messiah. Do you really think that, that, that he thought that because he was that, that he was going to get arrested because of that? See, we have to understand when we serve the Lord, bad things can still happen to us. Even though we serve him. Just like the um, Apostle Paul. He was in prison, shipwrecked, without food. That has nothing to do with serving God. Those are some things that we might have to go fall into. 
We might get put into places we never thought we would, but God might put us there to what? Get someone into the kingdom to get them saved. Instead of getting frustrated, we understand, God, why am I here? What do you got me in this situation for? For what? For your glory. Let me use it to glorify you. So we don't get what? Frustrated. Because God's not a genie that's going to give us a great life down here. He says, I'm going to give you the a, a power to handle your life down here. And it might get rough, but I'm with you and I'll never leave you nor forsake you if you trust and believe me. It's a big if there. How many of us go through a lot of problems and get mad and say, God, I thought, you know, I go to Bible study, I pray. Why is this happening to me? That's why. Because you do go to Bible study and pray. The devil's going, this is his world. He's going to send problems down here at you. Because you serve a mighty God. You have to understand and be prepared. Fail to prepare, prepare to fail. That's why you have to get taught the right stuff, knowing that we're living in a kingdom of darkness right now. And we're bringing light into that darkness, and there's people who don't want light. And it sheds light on them, and they get bitter. You tell people about Jesus, oh, I don't want to hear about that stuff. I'm, I'm, I'm my own God unto myself. I don't need him. He's not real. I'll tell you what, if he's not real, then somebody changed my life, and I know it wasn't the devil. I am no longer that man I used to be. And it's not anything to do with me, it's the God, the Holy Spirit. I can't give credit to anything else. There's no such thing as self-help. We can't help ourselves. We think we can, but the result is death, not life. There's a Bible says there's a way that people think is right, but in the end leads to death. God knows the beginning to the end. We don't. He says, if you follow me, I'm going to give you a safe landing. You don't follow me. You choose your own God, all bets are off. You're going to reap the consequence of following a false God. And all I can do is pray for people who worship false gods because they don't see it coming. They don't see it coming. The Bible says it will come. It might not be in my time, but it will come. So I pray for people to find Jesus because he's the only one that can get us there safely. Ain't getting amen here. All right. The first disciples, verse 16. One day, as Jesus was walking along the shore of the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon. Simon is called Peter, okay? And his brother Andrew throwing a net into the water. For they fished for a living. Jesus called out to them, Come follow me, and I will show you how to fish for people. <laughs> and they left their nets at once and followed him. Think about it. God calls you. Do you say, Well, let me go home and think about it? Or do you drop what you're doing and follow him? That's what a disciple does. When he calls you, you drop what you're doing and you follow him if he is your Lord and Savior. If he's not your Lord and Savior, you will not drop what you're doing. I have to get what I might get done first and then I'll come to you. But when he's truly your Lord and Savior, you will drop what you're doing and follow him. Amen? And that's a process. I don't know about you, but wherever I'm called, I'm there. Because if, I don't, if God don't call me, somebody else is gonna. It's called the devil. And I used to follow him, so I gotta stay near Jesus so I don't. He never, went, he never goes away. He's right there. Wherever I go, Jesus is with me, but guess who else is with me too? He's right behind me. Satan. Waiting. You know, remember, anybody remember the Flintstones? You remember the Flintstones? Remember? On his shoulder? There was the little devil, and there was an angel on the shoulder. And the devil would always pitchfork the angel off. Well, it's the same thing. That I can give you that analogy, because that's what happens to us. Wherever we fell in, the devil has us. We sold out to, he's up there. And the angel's on the other side. So when you grow spiritually... The angel knocks the devil off. 
But when you don't go spiritually, guess what happens? The devil knocks the angel off. And what? Well, bets are off. So that's why spiritual growth is the key. So we knock the devil off and not the angel. I get an amen for this. I can't make it any simpler. If you watch the Flintstones, you'll see them. <laughs> that and the great kazoo, too. He's there. Yeah. But do you, you understand what I'm saying? That th The same mentality is in all of us. You know, you'll see Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde. All of us have that in us. We all have good and evil in us. Something that sparks the anger in you, what comes out of you? Dr. Jekyll comes out, right? You, just, rah, you start going crazy, right? And you do the right things, and you, oh, and you knock them off. A, a kind word knocks down the anger. Get it? It's the same thing, but we both have... Who, who can honestly say they don't have both and living in them? We both have good and... We all have good and evil in us. But, before we found Jesus, we couldn't make the right choices. Now that we have the power of God, we can knock the evil out of us. So we have to understand that he's not going anywhere. So we have to fight him. With who? Scripture. Beat it. Get behind me, Satan, for it is written. I ain't following you today. How's that one? Go bother somebody else. Go bother your, your other minions. And, not, and let me just tell you one thing. Satan's just not alone either. Satan has minions. And he has people all around. See, people don't understand the spiritual realm. The spiritual realm is really creepy. There's devils and angels always all around us. If we, if we could lift the veil, we'd be able to see it. Right now, the church is full with them. And devils. They're out there everywhere. It's pretty scary, ain't it? It's hard, it's hard to fight an enemy you can't see. That thought that comes into your head when you're praying. Right? You're praying real nice and everything. Something comes into your head. It's so like off. Now, where did that come from? How could you explain it? Where did that thought come from? It came from another realm. It came from another source. It came from Satan. He came into our mind. And made us think something vulgar while we were praying to Jesus. Or, you draw a blank. How many of us draw a blank when you're praying? Here I am with intentions on praying. And if there ever was ADHD, it's when I pray. I can't stay focused. The devil's always trying to scramble it up on me. So I have to what? Shake my hands. No, no, no. Get refocused. I don't just give up. I just, nope, stop. Lord, I'm submitting to you. I'm resisting the devil. I need to get these prayers out. And we have to keep going. Am I the only one that goes through this? Does everybody else get that when I'm talking about? Sometimes we forget to pray all together. Well, how can we forget the things that are good for us and never forget the things that are bad? It's crazy. That's how we know we got a sin nature. We can keep a record of account and every bad thing that happened to us. Whenever somebody did something to us, we keep it in our record book. And whenever you see that person, you know it's right there. But you forgot that they helped you fix your tar and help you fix your flat and gave you a ride home one night when you couldn't make it home. Because that whatever you, whatever they did wrong is overpowering what they did that was good. See, Jesus wants us to see what's good in people, not what's bad. The devil wants us to see what's bad in people and not what's good, and he wants us to do it while we're in church. But see, people don't understand. There's a tempter out there. There's a source out there that's getting into our minds. Principalities and powers of the air. Powerful stuff. And everybody thinks it's not, it's not that, but that's what it is. See, when people see things that we don't see, they can see into the realm we can't see. It's there. They can see what we can't see, but it's there. It's real. It's not an illusion. There's a realm out there, the Bible, either that or the Bible's lying to us. Right? We're not fighting against flesh and blood enemies. 
about powers of the unseen world. If there's an unseen world, we can't see it, obviously. Something, something's fueling it. <laughs> All right, and, and look at verse 18. They left their nets at once and followed him. So when God calls you or you get a prompting, just let me give you this little advice. When you get a prompting of the Holy Spirit to do something, don't wait. Act right on it at that time. If, it's, if, if somebody wants you to pray, pray right then and there. Don't wait and say, I got to think about it. Do it right then and there. Because other than that, you're going to forget. Whenever you get prompted, do it right away. Don't wait. That's what he's trying to say. And they left it once to follow him. All right, verse 19. A little farther up the shore, Jesus saw Zebedee's son, James and John, in a boat repairing their nets. He called them at once, and they also followed him. Leaving their father, Zebedee, in the boat with the hired men. Imagine they just, dis they just left. Now, let me just explain something here. We often assume that Jesus' disciples were great men of faith from the first time they met Jesus. But they had to grow in their faith just as all of us believers do too. Okay? This is apparently not the only time Jesus called Peter, Simon, James, and John to follow him. It tells us in Luke 5, 1 to 11, and John 1, 35 to 42, for two other times he called them. Okay? Although it took time for Jesus' call and his message to get through, the disciples followed him. In the same way, we may question and falter, but we must never stop following Jesus. Never stop. Jesus casts out an evil spirit. How do I know there's evil spirits? Well, the Bible tells us there is. I don't know. Sometimes I think there's a couple in me still. When I get... Something happens inside of me. I just can't understand that there's, some, there's sin living in me that does it. I really can't understand myself, the Bible says. I want to do the right thing, but there's something in me sometimes that just... There's just that war with my mind. I can't deny that. I can come up here all I want and preach. No, there's, there's something living inside me that's against God still. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? There's still something there that's at war with that. It's called my sin nature. It's still there. I and mean, it's not going anywhere either. And sometimes, sad to say, it gets the best of me. How about you? Let's be honest here. This is a real church. It gets the best of me. That's why when I see people down here that are struggling and fighting, I can understand what you're struggling and fighting with because I struggle and fight with you. And I do, I go through the same things you do. So that's why I don't say, well, you just don't study hard enough or you just don't have enough faith like other people say. No, it's because I got a sin nature and sometimes it takes the best of me. All of us. None of us are better than anybody. And when you can be like that, then we can what? Grow stronger together. We fight the battle together. You know? I know the closer I get to God, the more the devil wants me to get away from him. This body wants to go towards sin. It just does. Naturally wants that. You know as well as I do. You go pay tons of money for something that's not good for you. But then you complain it costs $10 for vitamins. That are good for you. But you'll go spend 500 on something that's killing you. You know what I mean, right? I'm trying, to, I'm trying to relate with everybody here. We all struggle with this. Thank God we got a Savior. That's why I love Jesus. Because he's not... He's like, I understand, John. I'm with you. Don't worry. I'm going to get you through this, John. And he's my best friend. I just go right to him. See? When, I do, when something goes bad inside of me, I run closer to him because I know he's the only one that can fix me. The devil wants us to run away from him. You think he wants to talk to you right now what you just did? Yeah, he does. He wants me to talk to him because if I, did, if I talked to him, that wouldn't have happened. I talked to the devil instead. And he got me. 
All right, look at verse 21. Jesus and his companions went to the town of Capernaum. When the Sabbath day came, he went into the synagogue and began to teach. The people were amazed at his teaching, for he taught with real authority, quite unlike the teachers of religious law. Now, let me just say something, because we're going to have to close here. Jesus had recently moved to Capernaum from Nazareth, okay? Capernaum was a thriving town, okay, with great wealth, as well as great sin and decadence. Because it was the headquarters for many Roman troops, pagan influences from all over the Roman Empire were pervasive. This was an ideal place for Jesus to challenge both the Jews and the non-Jews with the good news of God's kingdom. That's why he went there, okay? Let's go to verse 23. Suddenly, a man in the synagogue who was possessed by an evil or unclean spirit cried out, Why are you interfering with us, Jesus of Nazareth? That's what, the, that's what he does to us, right? When the devil's working with us, why are you interrupting him? I'm getting inside of him. Leave him alone. Leave me alone. Let me get him. Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus reprimanded him. Be quiet. Come out of the man, he ordered. And that evil spirit screamed, threw the man into a convulsion, and then came out of him. Imagine. Let me just say something before we close. Evil spirits or demons are ruled by Satan. Okay? They work to tempt people to sin. They were not created by Satan because God is the creator of everything. Okay? Rather, they are fallen angels who join Satan in his rebellion. Okay? Though not all disease comes from Satan, demons can cause a person to become mute, deaf, blind, or even insane. Okay? But in every case where demons confronted Jesus, they lost their power. Okay? Thus, God limits what evil spirits can do. They can do nothing without his permission. During Jesus' life on earth, demons were allowed to be very active to demonstrate once and for all Christ's power and authority over them. Some people dismiss all accounts of demon possession as a primitive way to describe mental illness. Listen up now. Although throughout history, mental illness has often been wrongly diagnosed as demon possession. Clearly, a hostile outside force controlled the man described here. Something to think about, amen? All right, we're going to have to close there. Thank you for letting me share that with you. Just understand that God's in control of all that. David, you want to come up and close us? And then we're going to have a song. Thank you. We can bow our heads. Lord Jesus, thank you for allowing us to come together once again to hear a portion of your word. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for allowing us to always gather together in the safety and the vicinity of your guiding hand. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for being a friend and a great teacher, for you understand all the temptations that we go through every single day. But always stay thanking you for being there for us when those temptations come. Help us, Lord Jesus, to be more mindful of not only the blessings that you gave us, Lord, but all the trials and to immediately come before your feet desperately needing your help. And you always answer, Jesus. Thank you for that. We're so eternally grateful for everything you have done for us and will continue to do for us. And I just pray, Lord Jesus, help us to continue to grow in your maturity and in your wisdom. And I say all these things in your precious and holy name. Amen. Amen. All right. Thanks, David. All right. We're going to do a song.